Hi, and um, I sure am glad to be here. And um, I know you've been bombarded with a lot of uh, information. So I'm hoping that this is not going to be too long, but at the same time, I should be able to highlight the uh, two new um, therapies out there. Two, I'm saying, because those are the newest. Um, and then we'll go from there. Um, so again, like I mentioned, my objective is to provide an overview of continuous therapies in Parkinson's disease and an emphasis in pump therapies. Now, I know you, know, you, you all have, Dr. Shah has gone over quite in depth about um, Parkinson's itself, but just to go over just a sweet little bit of history, the use of levodopa, now it's spanning 70 years since its approval. And um, L-DOPA itself, because we'll be talking about levodopa, basically, uh, most, mostly. So levodopa was first synthesized in a lab by a uh, Polish biochemist in 1911, Casimir Funk. And then in 1913, again, by another biochemist, it was isolated, um, Marcus Guggenheim, and it was isolated from an exotic bean plant, which means I mean, it has been used for years and years without really having a name to it. Anyhow, and uh, Marcus Guggenheim also discovered on himself that when he took it, he vomited violently. So, and in the 1950s, Arvid Carlson, he's, um, he was a pharmacologist, Swedish pharmacologist, who then discovered the role of dopamine in movement. In, a, in, in us, in human beings, and then finally got Nobel Prize for it in the year 2000. So basically all these little discoveries, of course there were other people who were also involved. Um, uh, Walter Berkmeyer, he was a neurologist, and in the 1960s he didn't used L-DOPA along with another colleague of his, um, IV. And they, they saw that there was a miraculous improvement in patients, but it was very short-lived. And finally, then George Kotsias used it in, in the East Coast, in New York, and he used the oral form, and he published a paper on its benefits. Now, it has still, to date, been it's the miracle medication, still is. Now, the problem, though, is a lot of challenges that we face with the use of levodopa. And, um, you know, so the main one, of course, it has it induces nausea and vomiting in patients. But its effects, like it, it's hard to anticipate its effect on a given individual. Um, every person is different with Parkinson's, that's what I tell my patients. But then the demographics of a patient or a certain person also changes how the levodopa affects, affects them. And it depends on the ethnicity, the age, the sex, and any comorbid other diseases somebody has, I mean, whether they're absorbing the levodopa well or not, and so on and so forth. So over the years, um, the medical community has struggled to come up with different ways of, um, of delivering the levodopa. Some of those are to be able to bypass our stomach, our gastrointestinal system, so that we can deliver it better into the, into the brain, and so that we can have more uh, the, the usage so that we can facilitate the efficacy can increase. As Dr. Shah mentioned, um, the, it's not that the effect of the levodopa starts to decrease as the disease progresses, and, or that, that is not the reason why we keep needing more and more of the levodopa, it's just that as the disease progresses, the nerves uh, that are producing dopamine are degenerating, and so more and more levodopa is needed. So um, there has been a mis misconception, um, even with other healthcare professionals, that more levodopa is needed because maybe it's not working as well. But that is really not the reason. The reason I'm talking about all this is to give a background. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. So why do we need the continuous therapies? Due to motor fluctuations that set in typically four to six years into the treatment. So about four to six years into the treatment, or about ballpark, 40% of patients with Parkinson's will develop motor fluctuations or dyskinesias. So what is it? It starts becoming an unpredictable off and on phenomena. Oh, again, everybody with Parkinson's is different, 
some people who do not develop it would j just do totally fine for years. And it's also that we've seen a difference in patients who started off with a tremor versus patients who started off with walking problems. And uh, overall, the trajectory of people who start off with a tremor has seemed to be better than the other patients, but again, everyone differs. So dyskinesia risk is minimal the first year of treatment. And after four to six years of therapy, approximately 40% of patients experience it. What is it? So now we come to what are these infusion therapies. Infusion therapies are treatments either through a small needle inserted under the skin or through a tube inserted into the small intestine. And this provides a continuous flow of drugs throughout the day. And levolopoa and apomorphine are two common infusion therapy drugs that address the lack of dopamine in the brain. So again, like we've mentioned it before, so levodopa is going to be our prototype, our main medication. And I will talk, I will touch on ipomorphine as we go ahead in the slides. So the concept is not new, concept in itself is not new. The Duopa pump uh, was approved in the United States in 2015. It had been used earlier in European countries, but it had, was approved, FDA approved in, um, uh, in 2015. So it, it is used to, basically it requires a surgeon or a gastroenterologist who does interventions to make an ostomy or an outside um, a mechanism through which the levodopa can be introduced into the, uh, into the duodenum, which is a part of the, the gastrointestinal tract. So it does require a minor or minimal intervention, um, which becomes a bit of a challenge for patients to um, kind of maintain. So some of the problems with it have been skin side reactions, and then there could be dislodgement of the tube, so that can be an issue too. But it, it's been used very successfully in many centers, so that has been a continuous um, infusion therapy. But then again, um, not everybody is the right candidate for an intervention, and not everybody is able to maintain or take care of that kind of an ostomy tube. Um, I'm going to spare all the details in this slide, but um, I already mentioned the complications. But anyway, the, uh, this continuous infusion does help with reducing the off periods and does help with maintaining a more of a stable uh, plasma concentration of the levodopa. So it does reduce those on off fluctuations. So the duopa pump, this is a picture showing how patients can like wear it because the, the device itself is pretty big. So it's a little, it can be cumbersome. So those are just different. There's a fitted belt, a hip pack, a vest, a fitted vest, chest pack, cross body pack. So different ways and methods in which patients can kind of pose that device on them. Um, this roticotine transdermal patch has been out there for many years. And this is actually a, um, it's, it's been a sub, um, an epidermal, a continuous pump therapy in a way, but it's in a patch form, um, and it's, it works on the dopamine receptors itself. It is not like levodopa, that it is not, um, it's, it's not giving the dopamine, it does not break down into dopamine itself. It's, it's um, marketed as the new pro patch. Um, it is, again, not the one size doesn't fit all, and it's not every patient is not the best candidate for it, but it is usually used as an adjunct to levodopa. There are certain more side effects of this compared to patients who are on levodopa, like lightheadedness. Um, there can be impulse control issues also that come with it. It's pretty similar. So it comes from a class of medications called dopamine agonists only, and uh, anyhow, it needs to be usually, typically, it's removed every 24 hours. Comes in different doses. This is a picture of the film. And again, like all these uh, transdermal device, uh, devices or um, uh, the, um, the main problem can be skin or allergic site reactions. In the car. Now what's new? So the new um, 
things on the market, the new stuff on the market is the Kavidu Palivido Pa Subcutaneous Infusion. And uh, it was approved in October of 2024, and it's called Violet. And it's a pro duodopa uh, pump, basically. So there's a precursor of levodopa that is, uh, that, that is um, released into the bloodstream, and then it is converted into L-dopa, and then it crosses the brain barrier. And then the other one is an apo apomorphine subcutaneous pump, also marketed as an APCO, which was approved this year obviously. Now it takes time for everything to come to the market and become more available to patients. There are lots of hurdles as you, you may be aware of, like insurance uh, hurdles and things to do before the, an individual patient is even able to get it, provided they are the right candidate for the medication. So the pro-duodopa, it is a new Parkinson's drug delivered continuously via a pump similar to insulin pumps used for people with diabetes. So you can imagine, well imagine, there will be no intervention like for the duopa pump, there was this um, inter intervention needed, although it's worked beautifully in many patients, but it can be a nuisance for some people. So for this, this is almost like, it's like an insulin pump. And the device itself is much smaller than the one that was being used for the duopa pump. In fact, there's a question whether this is now going to replace the du what, what the duopa pump was doing previously. Um, clinical trials show that it can be an effective option for those whose medications are wearing off or who may have dyskinesia. So we do need to be able to uh, demonstrate the off time that a, patient, a given patient has before we are able to even prescribe the Violev pump. So this is a little bit about the delivery system itself. Um, in four stages, we have it all like uh, sorted out here. You, what the first step would be to prepare the syringe. We add the medication into it, and then we insert it into the pump. And then the second step is to prime the tubing. You fill that up with medication. Then the third step is to place the cannula on the clean skin and connect the tubing, and then pump the medication by starting the pump. So, of course, all th these steps also might seem um, See, it seems complicated, but they're pretty straightforward. Um, again, we are just starting to prescribe it to our patients. They do, so they would be sending in a nurse to the home to start this, uh, this process with the patient, for the patient, and then we go from there. Um, there would be a few visits to the um, neurology, to the clinic, before this can be started and I, and the infusion can be started itself. And then, um, um, and then it's just required serial monitoring of how it is working. The main side effects for this again would be, as you can imagine, skin side reactions. They do not have, happen to everybody, but in about ballpark, about 20% of patients that can happen. So that is something to be aware of. Um, the next, system is the ONAPCO and the apomorphine infusion system. So apomorphine is, is also from a class of medications called dopamine agonists. Dopamine agonists work in a way that they go, the medication will go and it would attach itself to the dopamine terminals uh, that are empty because the patient itself are not making that dopamine. And that's how these medications work. So kind of similar to the rotigotine in a way, apomorphine has been out there for years, and it's an amazing medication in that, that it can work pretty fast. So there is a previous apomorphine um, um, uh, delivery method, which is by the name of Apokin, and that's a subcutaneous medication. We often give that to our patients for for unpredictable offs. Like if somebody knows they might they might become off when they have to go to the store or something, they can quickly inject that subcutaneously and then have that um, benefit. But usually, that benefit is short lived with the subcutaneous injection. Hence. This was a, a, this came out, and so this is a, this is a continuous infusion. So it has been shown to really help with the uh, fluctuations and with the motor offs. Um, how does it work? Again, just reading this out. Apomorphine works by binding to the dopamine receptors in the brain and replaces the natural dopamine that it is lacking. 
Again, side effects can be skin site reactions, nausea, and with apomorphine as it was with the rotagotine patch, hypotension, meaning low blood pressure and lightheadedness is something to watch out for. And this is what the delivery system would appear to be like. First and only continuous subcutaneous apomorphine infusion that can provide more consistent control of motor fluctuations in patients with advanced Parkinson's disease. Again, talking about advanced Parkinson's disease. So these would not be the best fit for somebody who's just initially coming in who responds beautifully to just add the oral levodopa. Usually we're talking five to six years down the road um, that the, when the motor fluctuations do start to like set in. So patients in the trial had 2.6 hours of less daily off time and 2.0 hours of more good on time. Again, this is self-applied each waking day. This is what the, the system looks like. So it's not, it's not a huge system. And um, yeah, this is a, I do not know if we're able to, um, this is uh, a link and it takes you to the site. Can we, I don't know if we can go on to it. But anyhow, this is from the website of the Enapco, um, no, the Violins. Dot com. So it has good like patient stories and that's how it works. Any questions? That's all. I mean, yes. There to been still research what the test money is. It's a late research. You raised the first hands, but you paid me. So the friendly and the is a place we so actually fresh and it's not a system. Oh, laser surgery for Parkinson's. Now, Dr. Kundu is here. She would be a, uh, the right person to talk to about it. But yes, uh, laser surgery, which is, I think you're referring to the MRI guided focused ultrasound, but other laser, there are other uh, ablative therapies out there for. And yes, they, they, the other ablative therapies have been out there for years. And then in around, I think, 2017 was when the unilateral laser therapy was approved. And then it, it's been recently approved as bilateral. And it's, it's, it's out there for Trevor. We are, at, at this point, not offering it, but we're in the process of, um, I think, working on it, from my understanding. Thank you. Yeah. So did you leave? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.